welcome to Leaders of Tomorrow, India's only daily television platform for MSMEs. We bring you some of the biggest conversations and expert opinions to empower you, the entrepreneur. Today on the show, we have two influencer conversations on game changers. First up, Meera Shanoi of Youth for Jobs. And second up, after a short break, we'll be in conversation with Access for All. India Inc. does dismally when it comes to its report card of providing jobs to those with any kind of physical disability and aiming to change just that is Meera Shanoi of Youth for Jobs. She provides training and skilling to those with physical disabilities to ensure that they're being hired by small businesses and India Inc. I spoke to her for some of her tips on how disabled and differently abled youth can find jobs in India Inc. Here's what she had to say. Mira, thank you very much for speaking with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow. Uh, let me start by first asking you to talk very briefly about Youth for Jobs uh, and Youth for India and what it is you really do. I founded Youth for Jobs six years back. What we do is we help companies either to begin their journey of inclusion or strengthen their journey of inclusion by mainstreaming hiring of youth with disabilities so that not out of pity or out of sympathy, but because it helps their business. So it's a fundamental shift actually in the work which we've done. A new program which we've started to reach out to educated youth with disabilities like engineers, IDIs, etc. is called College Connect and that takes us to the universities where we're actually setting up something called the Smart Inclusion Centers. And this both helps in enrollment of youth with disabilities into colleges and to make the present pool employable. Okay. Uh, the other very important work which we do is we do a whole series of services to companies to make sure that the youth which we give them are productive and have equal opportunity to be as productive if not more productive than others. And when companies experience this then hiring on scale happens and it just doesn't become a tick in the box. Uh, this work which we do even if I say it is absolutely transformational for the youth with disability. It's magical for girls. For companies, it really benefits them because uh, we encourage them to measure the impact of the work on companies. And for example, in the manufacturing sector, there's a productivity increase of something like attrition and productivity uh, improvement of something like 51%. And um, for government, of course, you know, your SDG goals can't be met unless the vulnerable have access to sustainable livelihoods. So it's win-win for all. Okay. Uh, India, though, clearly has a long way to go when it comes to uh, ensuring that they're inclusive workspaces. One or two things that you think should definitely change if more and more people who are differently abled need to become an integral part of the workforce. What's basically holding companies back from hiring of people who are differently abled? The first most important thing is a mindset change. These attitudes are so deeply ingrained. Uh, and one of the reasons is that unlike the West, in our schools, uh, they don't teach them about disabilities. Um, you don't have schools which are really inclusive in that sense. So the children don't understand about disability and they grow up not understanding then our streets, our malls, etc. are not accessible. So unlike the West where you see people on wheelchairs roaming freely, this doesn't happen here. So I think the first is that advocacy at all levels and you should begin preferably in school. Okay, uh, so for companies who are watching this interview, for small businesses that are watching this interview and saying, for instance, maybe having wheelchair access at companies or having special software at companies for those who are visually challenged is going to come at a cost and therefore uh, they are perhaps not as disabled friendly as they should be. One piece of advice to them, what should they look at? 80% of the workplace adaptations which we suggest are low cost. It's the cost is only, yes, for the visually impaired, the JAW software, that's expensive. But even there you have an open source software now called the NVDA, which is free of cost. 
So I think when the mind is willing, uh, solutions happen on their own. Uh, is there enough innovation though happening uh, for uh, uh, specifically for, uh, using uh, and providing solutions uh, to uh, people who are perhaps disabled? Do you think, are you happy with uh, innovation? We were talking about the software that's yeah. specifically targeted at those who are visually challenged for instance. But is there enough of that happening and therefore accessible to more people? I think some of it is happening, but what happens is like a lot of other innovations, there's a big gap between what happens in the research space and what actually gets piloted and then what you see on the field. There's this big gap between research and academia and the real world, what I call. So I think that gap needs to be actually bridged. That's one. And the second is that is enough happening? Not really, because this is such a new space for India. I, and Indians are very creative, so I'm always very optimistic. I think solutions will, will emerge. Okay, let's talk about the big picture on social entrepreneurship. Uh, why aren't more and more entrepreneurs perhaps looking at the space of social entrepreneurship? Is the money to be made as a social entrepreneur? Uh, do you think perhaps that could be something that's holding more people who are entering the workforce, who are looking at uh, innovation, who are looking at entrepreneurship, from entering the social entrepreneurship space? The way I look at it, in fact, I was asked this question even in the Stanford Business School, saying that, you know, what is the kind of sustainable business model you have? Uh, I think when you become a social entrepreneur, what you need to look at is that, what is the scale of impact you're making? Even if you don't make money, it doesn't matter. I, for example, have a very clear vision. My vision is to leave behind a better world. Okay, so it doesn't matter if I don't make a lot of money, we do make some money. But more importantly, what are the kind of lives, what are the number of lives which I'm transforming? What are the number of people whom I'm influencing through this work? And will I finally create a better world? I think that is the key question. Okay, uh, you were speaking very briefly about the government previously, and I just wanna come back to that. Uh, what's the role of the government when it comes to working with those who are differently abled, uh, as well as in the field of social entrepreneurship? I think in some ways what India has done is brought out this phenomenal legislation, which is called the Right to PWD Act in 2017. That's really phenomenal. Several developed countries have actually not done that. Uh, the implications for it is that for the first time, the act and the, and the law which follows talks about the right to even employability, not just in the public sector, but even in the private sector. Uh, the weakness of the act, however, is the fact that state governments have to implement it. So if a state government has other priorities, then it may not get implemented. But I think willy-nilly at some point of time, this will happen. Uh, there's also right to education. If you look at it currently in higher education, the number of youth with disabilities are possibly 0.5%, I'm told, whereas the act mandates are 5%. My question to you is, yes, there is policy. Uh, yes, there is uh, some bit of awareness at least, but what's going to bridge the two because the actual implementation on the field uh, is still lacking to some extent? I think government is never an implementer. The government is the one who gives the policy framework it's up to progressive NGOs like us, for profits who are passionate about the space, to take policy as a tool, if necessary, and move forward um, to create an impact on scale. Okay, and the government is also uh, ensuring and is also speaking about uh, uh, the CSR Act where basically 2% of your profits could mandatorily go towards that. A lot of critics are arguing that's not going to really do much. On what side of the argument are you? I think that's a fantastic legislation. Someone like us who's transparent, value-based, who does challenging work, we completely funded by CSR funds of companies. And companies really like organizations which are, which are extremely transparent, which use IT as a tool to bring transparency compared to the old NGOs which couldn't do that. Uh, so I think the CSR Act has been a boon to help organizations like us to make a difference. All right, my last question to you then. Uh, for someone who's watching this interview to say, I would like to have more disabled employees. I would like to uh, be able to reach out to more disabled and differently abled employees within my own organization. What should they perhaps keep in mind? First, understand that this is not 
um, a tick in the box that it actually helps your business. Second, once you open your mind, then companies don't have time to do it themselves. So you have to hire some expert who can help you through the journey. And the third is, I think, the ownership has to come right from the top and then filter through the organization. It cannot remain at the top. It has to filter through different levels of the organization. And the last is that there's a great difference between hiring a disabled and a non-disabled youth. So a lot of work has to be done within the companies. And um, I think it's a journey which has to be traversed together to make sure that youth with disabilities have equal opportunities for livelihoods. Thank you so much for speaking with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Time for a break. On the other side, Access for All is in focus tonight on our second Game Changers interview. More on that when we come back. Just stay tuned. back with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow and tonight on Game Changers we are talking about how those who are differently abled can be employed by India Inc and our second conversation tonight is with Access for All. According to Census 2011, 2.21% of India's total population is living with disabilities. And in this first part of uh, today's uh, episode, we brought you a conversation with a company that's aiming to train those with disabilities for jobs in India, Inc. Our second conversation tonight is with a company that's aiming to change perceptions and access to public spaces for those with disabilities. Shubhangi Sina caught up with Access for All to understand how this social enterprise is aiming to bring about change changes as far as reforms and bring those to fruition are concerned. Take a listen. Aapka favorite color kaun sa hai? Mera favorite color yellow hai. Yellow kyun? Kyunki uh, yellow color hai na, uh, mango ka uh, bhi color hai. Kyunki mango se uh, smell se pata chalta hai ki wo mango hai. Aur wo jab khate hai tabhi bhi aisa uh, uh, alag feeling aata hai ki ekdam पूरा मन में पूरा ये हो जाता है उस फीलिंग बहुत अच्छे लगते हैं इसके लिए येलो कलर बहुत अच्छा है हैव यू एवर वंडर्ड हाउ द विजुअली इंपेयर एसोसिएट विद कलर्स द ब्लूज एंड द ग्रीन्स दैट वी एसोसिएट विद ओशंस एंड स्काइज एंड ट्रीज सो इजीली More than the color, it's the texture that they associate more with. It's the feeling, it's the tactile aspect of that particular object that they associate with. Hi, I'm Siddhan Shah, founder of Access for All. Um, we started this organization after my initial interactions with disability at home. My mom, Anisha, she is partially sighted. She was not born with a visual impairment, but she acquired visual impairment 12 years ago. And that was my first interaction with somebody with a special need in our house. Like how my suddenly my house changed to becoming one of the most uncomfortable space for her. And being an architect, this was something that started drawing my attention to that. A space which you're so familiar with, where you've lived for such a long time and suddenly that space becomes not at all familiar for you. That was the first time I realized what it happens, like what it happens for those with special needs both like physically challenged as well as those with intellectual special needs. Along that same time, while I was studying in architecture, we did a competition which was hosted by UNESCO and ASI, along with my two friends, Jay and Siddhi. And the competition was about making World Heritage Sites in India disabled friendly. So that was again the first time I started realizing that yes, like even monuments, heritage sites, need to be made accessible to those with special needs. We won the competition and then later we were taken to Sachi Stupa, which is in Bhopal. So I still remember that experience of a visually impaired boy giving me the story of Buddha from the Jataka tales and his understanding, the iconography of Buddha, the chakra. And he could do that entire thing by touching the works which were 
in uh, the Sanchi Stupa. This was the first time that I realized that, yeah, like, why should we always put our hands down and not touch anything? Why not allow the experience of touch? Because that's the only way through which somebody with a visual impairment can experience or engage with a sight. So that led to me doing my master's in, uh, in Greece. I did my master's in heritage management from Athens. While I was there, while working with various different museums, I came across a tactile museum. And I was really fascinated because it said, please touch the artworks on display. And like it's something which you would not see in a museum. Like, please touch. Like, otherwise, you see in bold letters, please do not touch. Or bouncers around you saying that, please do not touch. Or move in a straight line. Do not use your hands. Do not touch your, uh, do not touch our works on display. And that changed a lot for me. So I started our journey. Access for All was formed at that time. We had a rough beginning. We met a lot of museum professionals who said that, no, we don't want such facilities, or we already have facilities like we have a ramp, or we have a, a parking facility for those with wheelchair, and I think they thought that that was enough. Or somebody would even say, yeah, our toilet is big, so wheelchair can go inside. But they didn't realize that there was much more than physical access. Like, accessibility is not just providing a ramp. Like, for example, how would somebody with a hearing impairment experience a museum or a curated work? How would somebody who is visually impaired experience a sight? What is the difference that you are providing to them by like, just getting them in a sight and not having them for them to touch or like no braille books over there? So our first break was at the city palace in Jaipur, where uh, they allowed us to uh, use their uh, space. They allowed us to interact with the museum gallery, the painting and photography gallery. And we developed the first tactile paintings for a museum where you could actually touch and feel a miniature painting. Seeing that, uh, we got introduced to DAG, which was known as Delhi Art Gallery. DAG is an art gallery based out of Delhi, in Bombay and New York. And they were really keen and allowed us to use their collection to make art accessible to those with special needs. For them, we developed a project called Abhas, which is a tactile art appreciation program for those with visual impairment. It's interesting because you would have an original work, and right next to the original work, you would have tactile reproductions of that work, which allows them to touch, feel, and understand, like which otherwise we would see. So in a way, the space, the space suddenly became more open. So for example, if I had to speak about the challenges that we faced, it was like A, B, and C. A was awareness, awareness about disability, awareness about special needs, and the things that they would need. B was the, the bad B word, which was the budget. Nobody thought that it was necessary to spend a certain amount towards making their complexes accessible and making it more inclusive. And C was the fact that everybody saw disability as charity. And that was one thing which we did not want. India is home to 36 UNESCO heritage sites, but not all of them can boast of fair accessibility. The facilities available on ground still remain unsatisfactory for most members of the differently abled community. Access for All is trying to bridge these very gaps and make experiential learning a reality for the disabled and help companies bring inclusivity in workspaces. While we are working on this, I have constantly worked with a lot of blind schools across the country. because we have, we. have with my mom being partially sighted, I came from a very strong understanding that I would not want to do anything for them without them. Like it, their participation was really necessary. That's why even in our Braille Press, we have our own Braille Press. It is run by people with visual impairment who do all our proofreading. They learn, they know how to operate a Braille Press, they know how to use the things. And that's how we thought that it is important to even give them the sense of employment, the sense of being important in doing something for their own community. Our organization started researching about how do you talk to them about shades, how do you talk to them about light, how do you talk to them about shadow, how do you talk to them about depth, because depth is one thing which they can't perceive. So if when you see our tactile works, you will see that they are made in a 3D format for them to touch and understand, like niche gaya hai, thoda upar hai. There, is, there are various levels in which they can understand. The artwork shows something which is in the foreground, which is in the background, which is in middle. And along with that, there are braille text which is uh, uh, put up over there. So while they're touching these things, while they're feeling the buildings, the wall, the sky, they're reading about these things. So we started integrating these things in our works. Following that, 
National Museum, which is in Delhi, they got in touch with us, and that was our first project with a government organization. It was amazing the way they responded with us. Like they were so open, they were so open to ideas of okay, let's do something together. And with them, we developed the first gallery in the country, which is a tactile gallery specifically for those with visual impairments, and it's called Anub. It's called Anubhav Gallery. Anubhav meaning something that you can touch, feel, and experience. So this gallery allows them to actually touch works which are reproduced, which are from our Indian history. For example, things like the in the, the the dancing girl from the Indus Valley. So there is a small uh, reproduction of that. There are votive uh, tablets from the temple. Uh, then there is uh, sculptures. There are metal objects. So all these things were recreated for that particular gallery, and the gallery was designed in such a way that it would cater to people with special needs, it would cater to people who are old, and it would cater to kids. Over time, like people started realizing the importance of accessibility. Plus, we are really happy that the country started taking certain decisions towards these. In 2016, there was the rights for people. The bill was passed for rights for people with disability. Like that bill. Has now been like passed, and people are really trying to amend that in different ways. So while we are working, while we are doing all these uh, workshops, interaction with schools, with a major funding came in through CSRs. We realized that what we were trying to do was nothing else but package that experience for them in a different manner. So for example, we realized that people in in this segment would have reduced mobility, so they would not travel a lot. So when we visited a school. We had an interaction with the principal, and she said that my students don't travel a lot, but I would really love to get elements of different places to them in in the school. So we developed that. So every two months, we get one city or one state from our country and get their artworks, their heritage building the sites in terms of their models. We get materials in terms of the food. So something that gets in touch with all their senses. So we've been doing projects. We've been working with people with various special needs in various demographics. But one thing that has always stayed with me is this one interaction with a kid. We were discussing with him, and you know, why you you came here, why you came, what did you like, what did you like about it? And his one line has stayed with me. It's like something that drives me to do what I do till date. And he just said that the fingers that read Braille can see things today. country of billions but our understanding about disability and impairment is so limited for us trying to provide access is perhaps just building a ramp in a building the question at hand is that will you and me as a country be able to change the way we look at disability will we be able to make this society inclusive and is it companies like access for all who can perhaps help us achieve this and change the game completely out of time on this episode of leaders of tomorrow if you have any feedback for us or you want to get in touch to feature your company here's how you do that leaders of tomorrow times group.com is our email id on social media tweet at us at sunand underscore j or lot underscore et now you can also leave your comments on our facebook page leaders of tomorrow on et now thanks for watching have a good night